The Deep Dark Truth Podcast makes no claims as to the guilt or innocence of anyone involved in this or any case, but we do take great care and responsibility in helping families raise awareness and get their voice heard. If you know a case that you believe needs more coverage, please email us at the Deep Dark Truth Podcast at gmail.com. The following episode does involve discussion of suicide, so please, if you think that might be harmful to your mental health, hang back a second, maybe don't listen, or listen when you're in a better place. You're in the place where mysteries and the missing meet, where conspiracies lurk around every corner. Welcome to the Deep Dark Truth. Welcome back to the Deep Dark Truth. I'm Mo. I'm Chip. And I'm Mikey. And today we're going to be talking about the unsolved case of Joanne Matuk Romaine. We're also going to be speaking with her daughters, Kelly and Michelle, and that interview will be interspersed throughout the episode. Because there's not a whole lot of room for merrymaking or even pausing today, before we get started, here is a promo from our friends at ODFM. Do you love true crime? Do you know someone or know someone who knows someone or know anyone who was murdered or committed murder? Then you'll love ODFM. Each week, hosts Kelly and Jenna will discuss crimes that are ODFM. One from murder. But beware, this podcast is not for the faint of heart. Or without a dark sense of humor. Now, let's get started. Joanne Matuk Romain was a 55-year-old woman from Gross Point Woods, Michigan. She was a giving mother to Michelle, Kelly, and Michael, and loved to cook, not only feeding her whole family, but sometimes the entire neighborhood. She was a true caregiver. If someone was sick, even someone who was barely an acquaintance, she was the person that showed up with a bowl of hot soup. She enjoyed entertaining and always having company over. Joanne was very close with her immediate family and her sister, enjoying their visits and time together whenever possible. But she had been somewhat estranged from other members of her family years prior due to family infighting, which put a pin in that. She was very protective of her children and always in contact with them for one reason or another. Her family described her as a helicopter parent before helicopter parents were a thing. She was a God-fearing woman who attended services at St. Paul's on the Lake for a number of years, and she held her fellow church members in high regard. But at some point on the night of January 12th, 2010, Joanne took her last breath. The circumstances surrounding her death have been controversial and involved lawsuits and spotty news coverage as the family of Joanne have demanded answers to their lingering questions. Today, we're going to be talking about the events that led up to her death, the controversy of the case, and the theories that have been proposed by the family and private investigators that led them to file a lawsuit against the city of Gross Point Farms and Gross Point Woods. On the night of Tuesday, January 12, 2010, Joanne's daughters were out to dinner when they first tried to get in touch with her mother. The family had been in court during the day, and when they found that Joanne's phone was off, they didn't think much of it, other than she had forgotten to turn it back on. What was your mother like when you last spoke with her? Everyone was in good spirits. She was in good spirits. We had a really good day um, in court. That was our first day of trial regarding our black mold case in which we had been in litigation for seven years. We had been waiting for this to go to trial, um, and we were in favor of of winning um, the trial. So I felt like everyone was in good spirits. She was in good spirits. And we were all in a good place at that point. When they arrived back at home and Joanne wasn't there, they decided to drive by their aunt's house as their mother would frequently make house visits to chat after church. With no sign of Joanne, they decided to go back home thinking that their mother likely beat them back by now. But soon after arriving back at the house, Joanne's daughters notice a police car driving slowly and then stopping in front of the house. Her daughter Michelle then approached the officer. The officer asked Michelle if her mother was missing. Joanne found this strange because her mother had only been gone for two hours and, to her knowledge, had gone to church like every other typical Tuesday night. Tuesday services were part of Joanne's normal routine. Upon inquiring as to why the officer had asked such a question, Michelle says that she was informed that, quote, I was sent here because she is missing, unquote. 
The family further learned that her mother's car was found in the parking lot of St. Paul's on the Lake Church, and that across the street, there had been footprints leading towards the lake. This struck Michelle particularly as strange because the car was not registered to her mother. It was actually registered to Michelle. If the police had run the plate, why would they assume that her mother had the car or had anything to do with the car at all? They also mentioned that there was a purse in the vehicle, but with no keys, they could not get in. So they hadn't discovered this through means of searching the vehicle, nor should they have had any probable cause to do so so close to the end of church services, which normally happened around 730. After hearing about the footprints and the vehicle sitting abandoned in the parking lot, Joanne's children rushed to St. Paul's against the police's advice. They obviously couldn't sit home knowing that their mother seemed to be missing. The family started calling her furiously now, hoping that their mother would pick up the phone and that there would be a reasonable explanation for all of this. Perhaps the car wouldn't start and with a dead phone she had decided to walk or get a ride from a fellow church member or start making her way to somewhere nearby where she could contact them. Nothing seemed to make any sense to her family. Joanne was terrified of both the dark and of water. But Joanne was declared a missing person after only two hours by the police department, and it would be 70 days before her remains were discovered by two fishermen on the Canadian side of the Detroit River near Boblo Island. So there were 70 days between when... She was first reported missing, and when the body was finally found, what was that time like? Um, Just chaos, um, so many unanswered questions, trying to figure out how, why, where she could possibly be, um, not wanting to believe that she was actually dead. Um, We spent 70 days literally looking for her, searching in every corner of the city. Any lead we got, we went looking for her. There was every day at our house, you know, between 50 and 100 people trying to help do anything they could to figure out where she could possibly be. I remember our friends mapping out kind of uh, areas that we could go and certain people could go and leave flyers at people's houses or um, just going anywhere in the community trying to have outreach for, you know, where she could possibly be or just trying to align ourselves with a some type of answer. At that point, what was your working theory? Did you think that she had even went near the lake? Did you think that she was somewhere else? Did you not really have any theories? Well, at that time, we just knew in our in our minds and in our hearts, we knew that she had been abducted for the plain reason that she told everybody if something happened to her. Looked to our cousin Tim, who was the cop, um, who had subsequently threatened her um, and told her that he could make her disappear and no one would ever know what happened to her. That Those are pretty strong words, and that's something that she confided in multiple people and told. Um, she told dozen dozens of people if something happened to her to look to this cousin cop so obviously right away she's disappeared you go right to what was told that you know she was threatened to disappear by this cousin cop so from the get-go we knew it was involving him but we didn't know why he would do such a thing During the time of the 70 days of waiting, the Gross Point Farms Police Department allegedly gave the case over to the Gross Point Woods Police Department where Joanne lived. But as Gross Point Farms was the original contact for the case, that is who the Canadian authorities reached out to after Joanne was found. It's unclear why the case had jurisdictional issues. I'm not sure that I really understand, as usually the last place a victim or a person is seen, that then takes jurisdiction, but moving on. The Gross Point Farms police answered the call and went to retrieve the body. They then allegedly told the Canadian coroner that Joanne's death was being investigated as a suicide. They had also told them that Joanne was mentally ill and depressed. 
There was no evidence of this from her family or her physicians. In fact, Joanne had been making plans for a vacation with her friends just days before. At what point did the police tell you that they suspected suicide? Did they ever say they believed it could be an accident? No, they basically, from the get-go, made it seem as though it was a suicide. And even the chief of police um, from Gross Point Farms testifies that within five minutes, they determined that no crime had been committed against her and that it was a suicide. So let's talk about the Canadian coroner and the subsequent coroner reports. The Canadian coroner concluded that Joanne drowned but could not determine a manner of death. The body then crossed international borders, coming to a medical examiner in Michigan, and that coroner reached the same conclusions. That second coroner, though, did note that they felt the homicide was, quote, less likely than suicide because Joanne had no significant injuries. Also, that they believed that an accident seemed, quote, quite unlikely because Joanne had no reason to be near the water which she may have had a reason to be near the water, which is something that we're going to bring up in the inconsistencies portion. The family, not feeling very confident in their local authorities, then turned to a doctor at the University of Michigan. The doctor at the University of Michigan also reported drowning as the cause of death, or rather dry drowning, with an undetermined manner of death. It was during this final coroner report that the family discovered that Joanne had some amount of bruising, especially in her chest area. It was in the same place where she normally rested her purse, so that kind of cross strap area going across your chest, and that area was bruised, indicating that perhaps someone had forcefully grabbed it to where it had to push against her body. So how did your family find out what the police told the coroner? Was it through the PI? So we found out through the course of discovery that they had stated to the Canadian um, that she had severe mental health issues and was suicidal. And um, it was in the Canadian report, and it's documented um, specifically that Detective Michael McCarthy stated to them that this woman had severe mental health issues with suicidal, that this was ruled a suicide. Um, the Canadian authorities at that time and pathologists stated that they could not consider this a suicide because even though they were being told this information by the Gross Point Farms police detectives, there was no evidence to substantiate what they were saying, meaning there was no physician that said this occurred. You know, with her mental health, there was no documentation to support that she had mental health issues, so they could not rule it a suicide. They they ruled it undetermined. I think the police's reasoning for doing that was so that it was ruled a suicide and that this could just be a closed case. So this is the point where we get a little bit into the police timeline. The following is an excerpt from a lawsuit filed against the city of Gross Point Farms and Gross Point Woods from the estate of Joanne Matuk Romain. Quote, According to the police, the investigation started when an officer spotted Joanne's car around 9 p.m. After running her license plate, the officer took no further action because the car was on private property. About an hour later, a different officer noticed the car. That officer was more concerned because the car was alone in the drive, no one was around, and it was a cold night. The officer approached the car and looked inside. No one was there. People often park at the church, cross the street, and go down to Lake St. Clair. Suspecting that the car's driver may have done the same, the officer looked around. Nearby, he saw footprints in the snow heading towards an embankment. The officer followed the footprints. He then saw an imprint suggesting that someone sat on a break wall near the lake, pushed off to a second break wall, and then sat on that second break wall above the water. No footprints led back from the lake. Unquote. Again, that is from the estate of Joanne Matuk Romain versus the city of Gross Point Farms. The police put forward a timeline where Joanne went to services at St. Paul's and then speculated that she walked across Lakeshore Drive, climbed down the rebarred rocky embankment below, and took her own life. 
This timeline would be disputed by the family, and we'll address it in just a moment. How was dry drowning explained to your family? Did you know previous what dry drowning was? We did not know what that meant. Um, And so it was explained to us that a dry drowning is there is no water in your lungs, and which means you are usually like dead or like when, before you hit the water. But because you're found in water, they have to rule it a drowning. So when your lungs are a normal weight, there's some other problem. Um, you know, if you, it's a dry drowning. So, you know, whether your airway was blocked before you hit the water or you're already dead or something to that nature. And that's how it was explained to us. So it was basically she was either suffocated and or already dead. Her breathing was severely compromised or she was not breathing at all when she hit the water. And that's how it becomes a dry drowning. Because you're not actually inhaling. You're you're not breathing to inhale water. So before we talk about the lawsuit, let's talk about some of the inconsistencies the family came upon that led them to file that lawsuit. So in the weeks leading up to Joanne's disappearance, Joanne told many people that if something happens to her, to look to her cousin. Her cousin being a local police officer from a neighboring district. And allegedly had told Joanne that he could, quote, make her disappear. She even went so far as to tell a paralegal that she had worked with in the past and her daughter, Michelle, who at the time didn't know the extent of the threat, only that her mother was fearful. Did you know right when your mother disappeared that those threats had been made? Or did you learn shortly after? I knew that a threat had been made to her from him. I didn't know what was said. Exactly, but later on we found out exactly what was said, which was, quote-unquote, I could make you disappear and no one will ever know what happened to you. The only thing that we did know for certain is that a phone call took place from our the cousin cop, Tim Matuk, to our mom, December 10th. An uh, argument ensued. She hung up the phone at that time and said to me, if something happens to me, look to Tim. So I knew at that point that there was some type of threat made. I didn't know exactly the nature of the threat, but I knew that she was concerned and afraid of what he had just said. And she, from that point, told multiple other people the same thing. If something happens to me, look to Tim. Um, and at that point, um, following that, she started saying that she felt like she was being followed, just somebody trying to get a routine down. And, you know, she was concerned. Another inconsistency that popped up was that there was lost witness reports, one from a man named Paul Hawk that had come forward and given a statement to the police that he had seen a woman in the snow on the embankment along with two men and two cars, one being a Lexus and one being a Sudan. Both were parked in the street on Lakeshore Drive. Footnotes with Chip. Lakeshore Drive is two lanes on either side of a grassy median. There are no lanes for parking, which means that any car would have had to stop in the middle of the road. Thank you, Chip. It's important to note here that one of those cars matched the description of the car that Joanne was driving. Paul even sketched the men that he saw that night, but Paul's statement was either never added to Joanne's file or was later removed. Later, the police would say that they found Paul to be an unreliable witness, but Paul maintains that he volunteered to take a polygraph. A second witness said that she saw an underdressed man in a scarf near the brake wall. The police did indeed find a black scarf, which ended up being brought to the family's attention during discovery, and they kept it for some time, although it was never tested. The family further learned that that scarf was donated to Purple Heart. Did Joanne perhaps see this man and try and help him? This would at least give probable cause for why she may have gone near the break wall, and it would have given police reason to think that this could have possibly have been an accident. The water that night was a chilling 33 degrees. Footnotes with Chip. That's 0.5 degrees Celsius. 
even someone who was not scared of the murky depths of Lake St. Clair would have had a hard time choosing such a fate, as the water was only two feet deep at the shoreline. This would have required Joanne to physically walk out to deeper parts of the lake. Through experts, the family later learned that Joanne would have had to walk the equivalent of four football fields in order to surpass her height, which was four foot eleven. At the scene, the footprints left in the snow didn't seem to match what Joanne was wearing the night that she disappeared. There was also multiple sets of footprints, which police have said were from the search. On the night that Joanne disappeared, she was wearing a size 5 high heel. For the people listening who may not have a firm grasp of women's foot apparel, this is a very small shoe size, and the average size for a woman's shoe is 8.5 to 9. None of the imprints found seemed to match the inlay of the shoe that she was wearing, and it would have been incredibly hard to traverse the brake wall in the manner that the police said that it would have happened. All of the photos, and according to her children's observations, the footprints seemed to be consistent with a much larger shoe. So when did you actually first see the footprints? At the scene or in the crime scene photos later? Um, the footprints are interesting overall because the basis of this case and what the police put out to the public was there were footprints that led from the car to the water's edge and no footprints returning. But in actuality, the car was parked in the driveway. The pavement was dry. There was no snow on the ground by the car. There was footprints 136 feet away, which experts have um, calculated and measured. So 136 feet from the car, they just assumed that those were her footprints, even though they didn't match her shoe size or the indentation on her sole of her shoe. Um, The only footprints that we ever observed that night and in the crime scene photos were that of a men's size 10 work boot, maybe a size 12 work boot, if that. Um, There was no... There was no um, sign of a woman's high heel shoe whatsoever. But we really didn't, like, we didn't really look at the footprints clearly until they came up in the pictures. We saw them real quick that night, but we're like, none of those match her, so we kept moving. We didn't pay any attention that night because we knew she wasn't over there. Continuing on with inconsistencies. Yes, we're still on inconsistencies. A month before her disappearance, Joanne's spare key went missing. The family looked all over for it and never found it. At some point, the police came into possession of that spare key, but when pressed, they couldn't say how, when, or who the key had come from. This was brought up in the lawsuit. Joanne's everyday keys were found on her body when it was discovered. Footnotes with Chip. Keys are not generally known to have teleportation or invisibility powers. Wow, Chip, that is an extremely good point. Thank you for bringing that up. The police also never investigated the possibility of a homicide or an accident, which was strange when there were possible threats made to somebody that disappears under mysterious circumstances and then is found later deceased with one of those missing witness statements, the possibility that it could have been an accident. And yet that angle never seems to have been worked. There was also, of course, the presence of that black scarf. If you're in the Detroit area and you picked up a black scarf from Purple Heart shortly thereafter, January 12th, 2010, hit up the tip line. You might have a piece of evidence because evidently that's a thing that can happen. I'm so sorry. I couldn't contain myself. Moving on to more professional waters. The less inconsistency and perhaps the most mind-boggling, Michelle Romaine has obtained a time-stamped Coast Guard record that were reviewed by the Detroit Free Press for authenticity. Those records show that the Coast Guard received the call to search for Joanne's body in Lake St. Clair at 9.30 p.m., but the lean on her car when the plate was run that first started the investigation, that didn't happen until approximately 10 p.m., How did they know who they were looking for? How did they know which house to go to in order to contact her children? How did they 
know who they were looking for. While there is no conclusion to this case in terms of it being solved, there was, of course, a conclusion to the lawsuit. Named in the lawsuit were Joanne's cousin Tim, specific police officers and officials, as well as the pseudonym Killer John Doe. And of course, as previously mentioned, the cities of Gross Point Woods and Gross Point Farms. In the end, a federal judge concluded that while Joanne's death was a mystery shrouded in, quote, very disturbing facts, unquote, there wasn't enough proof of a conspiracy as the family couldn't prove that any perpetrator would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that any specific members of the police department would cover up a homicide knowingly. The judgment said, and I quote, I leave the scope of equal protection for other cases. For present purposes, I note only the equal protection question strikes me as a more appropriate question to ask for the type of failure to protect allegations that are presented in this appeal. That in turn indicates that the due process question is the wrong question to ask. So I'm inclined to think this area worthy of reexamination in a suitable future case, unquote. This is really interesting to me because there hasn't been very many times I've seen a judge basically tell a complainant, like telling a family that is suing, I can't rule in your favor because of these precedents under the kind of case that you've presented to me. But if you were to submit another lawsuit and these other things being the arguments and being the foundations of that case, I basically think that you have a fantastic chance, you should do that. That lawsuit was the last headway of any sort that was really made in this case. The case at this point, um, they're still saying that they believe it's a suicide. Um, but if you ask them, they'll probably say it's open and inactive. Um, right. Until until evidence comes, this, and this is what the local police are saying, until evidence is given to them that is worth investigating. Now, I don't know what kind of evidence they're looking for because we gave them the cousin cop, which they refused to investigate, who threatened my mom before she disappeared. We gave them Paul Hawk, who walked in that same week that she disappeared and gave them very detailed information about two men, about the Lexus that she was driving and a person that they appeared to be my mom at the scene. They refused to investigate that. So I'm not really understanding what they're looking for that would actually make them investigate. We're all wondering, what what type of information are they looking for to investigate? What do you think may have happened? So we believe that my mom uncovered something that she wasn't supposed to know that was compromising um, to the very person that threatened her, which is the cousin cop. And... We don't know exactly what it was, but there's speculation of of different situations that she could have um, uncovered. But what we can say is that she uncovered something that she wasn't supposed to know it was compromising. And at that point, it was thought that she had to been getting rid of or they had to get rid of her to shut her up. So here we're not going to go into explicit detail about things that have been uncovered over the course of the family's investigation, both working with experts, private investigators, investigative reporters, and others in order to bring this to light. We obviously don't want to compromise any unbiased police work that may happen in the future or any of their future lawsuits, and we also don't want to obviously allege anything without being able to give you any of that information. But if you do want to do a deeper dive, you can look at the sources through some other investigative reporting that has been done on this case. So what's the one thing you want people to know? What's your call to action? So right now, it's just community outreach with this case. People need to know the truth that, you know, my mom was abducted, that she was murdered, that this has been covered up for 10 years. Um, we've been trying to expose this case for as long as it's been going on, um, you know, for what it truly is, which is a cover up of a murder. And right now we have um, an upcoming episode on Netflix on Unsolved Mysteries. It will air October 19th. Um, and we also have a Facebook page, um, Twitter page, and a Instagram page. 
Uh, you can go to Justice for Joanne Matuk Romain. And on there, there's a lot of information about the case, information about um, the conspiracy and the questions surrounding it. And um, you can reach us there. Thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. We want to thank Kelly and Michelle again so much for joining us. Thank you so much. And tell you that all of the Justice for Joanne links are in the show notes. Please be sure to check those out and go follow them on social media. Also, all of our sources, of course, are in our link tree. You might at this point say, Mo, this is the shortest episode, and that's partly because we attempted to contain ourselves. I know that a lot of people have been listening to our true crime episodes to go to sleep, So we've started something that we call After Dark. After Dark is more of the research phase of a case where we get all of our what the fucking out, yell at each other. So you can check out that following this episode if you want to or not, of course. It's a choose your own adventure, but that is where you will find the commentary. I'm sure Chip can't wait. The After Dark companion episode will be released on Wednesday. Also, make sure that you check out Joanne's Unsolved Mysteries episode that comes out October 19th and start hashtagging Justice for Joanne. Any help that our listeners can give them in terms of gaining some momentum on social media would be absolutely fantastic. And we would appreciate it. And we know that they would appreciate it. So please do that. Until next time, I'm Mo. I'm Chip. And I'm Mikey. Allegedly. Allegedly. You just listened to the Deep Dark Truth Podcast. See you next time. And remember, your local cryptids want to meet you.